Well, okay, this is the uh, first episode of Screaming Creativity. My name is Rob Riley. I am the Global Chief Creative Officer of WPP. With me, my first guest ever in this pilot episode, Devika <laughs> Bulchandani, right, correct? You got it right. This who is the Global CEO of Ogilvy, one of the best agencies in the world. And uh, she's a great friend of mine and a great champion of creativity. And John Halverson, who is uh, also a great, I think, new friend. I think that's yeah. a good way to describe it. And John is the SVP of Consumer Experience and Digital Commerce and also someone who is a great champion of creativity. Thank you for being here. Thanks Thank for having you. us. Yeah, Thank you well. for having us as your pilot. Well, I knew I wanted to start off strong. And uh, the only way to start off strong is with, with uh, superstars. And I think you guys are both superstars of uh, the business. And I'm not, what does winding, he want? I'm not yeah. winding you up. <laughs> I just want magic from you. So <laughs> please deliver. Uh, but first question, uh, why do you love creativity? Why do you love advertising? Maybe why have you stayed in advertising? You go, go first. Yeah, look. I wanted to go into investigative journalism. I mean, that's what I went to my undergrad for at University of Missouri. And then in my Journalism 200 class, Steve Kopsch, who's a former global chief creative director, walked in. And anyone who didn't want to do advertising at the end of that class was dumb. I was convinced because he just showed the magic and potential of it. And I think that why I love this industry is because everything is possible within the four walls of an ad agency. I think there is no nothing that an ad agency cannot do, cannot dream up, that they could not have done by the end of the day and have clients bought in tomorrow. And I just think that if you don't love that, then go to an accounting firm because it will be the same every single damn day. I like that. So he's starting off strong. Super I like strong. That. Yeah. Um, I, I guess you know my perspective and my story is a little bit um, of an immigrant story. I moved in. I didn't know what to do. And the only thing I knew is every Indian person who comes to New York, they're going to be either an investment banker accountant, lawyer, doctor, and I didn't want to do that. And I just sort of happened to uh, be at a copy center making $7 an hour, and somebody gave me a job for $18,000, and I was like, I struck what the was, gold mine. What was the first job? My, my first job was to be a planner at Anderson and Lemke. So you tell your parents, I'm going into advertising. Was that a positive response <laughs> experience for you, or were they like, what the hell are you doing? It was positive on uh, September 9th of uh, 2022, because then it said CEO. Oh, interesting. So that was positive. Till then, they didn't have a clue what I did. All they knew is I was deliriously happy. It's the art of the possible. I know we say that, but it's almost like the art of the impossible, because that's what we do, is we just dream new realities. And the culture at, in sort of our industry is bring us the toughest thing that's never happened before, and we get to say, you know, and Rob, you talk about this delusional optimism. We just sort of go at it and say, we're going to make it happen. I mean, how incredible is that? And were you, as, as a young person going into this business, were your family, parents, any pressure to do a certain thing? or? No, i am tell you what, both my parents are in the medical field and just were super supportive. I think they, my dad really taught me early, you have to do something that you're passionate about. My first job was, I was the copywriter for KOMU, the local NBC affiliate in Columbia, Missouri, and I have produced a series of really terrible ads. And, and we have some of those ads here today, John. I don't know if you know that. We have the them. chocolate factory. Uh, here we go. Yeah, yeah. Go, Cue the footage. Why do you feel that you have uh, bravery so, you know, much a part of your DNA when it comes to advertising and marketing? I think that where it comes from in Mondelez is just a desire to be great. I mean, like, ultimately, the brands deserve it. They are national icons. So I think that sets a really high standard. And then I think there it comes from a place of also just partnership. I mean, I think that we know what we can do, what we can't do, and we just lean into that. And I think as we simplified our agency structure from having 600 down to like four, you found out who your real friends are, and then you can commit to a relationship. And I feel as though when you commit to a relationship and it becomes not a commercial relationship, it's not, I can't, anyone can go buy your time, but I can't buy your energy, your heart. I, I try and own people's shower time. Like mm -hmm. shower time is prime time thinking time. And if we can just be really damn good clients, and it shows up in buying work that's bold, it shows up in leaning into an idea, even when we're not totally sure, I think it comes from just really open and transparently sharing our problems. I mean, John, I have to say, from our perspective, you also create a culture 
uh, because you can do the same thing and you can, you know, a client can tell the agency to be brave and be bold and do it through fear and intimidation and a sense of constant anxiety. What you do brilliantly well is not just set the ambition and a sense of partnership and relationship, but a sense of safety that allows our creative teams to actually go out there and be bold. When I took the job and I wanted to run agencies and then I hired my secret weapon all this is Megan Johnson who's been running agencies for me for years is just people who had really d- and been on the other side of it and I worked with great clients I have no I have no damn excuse to suck there's this mm. enthusiasm around it and they're really created a culture of mentoring and you just get excited you know like I want my agencies to win I want them to win I want to be happy and like I think the more you take the commercials out of it just be like guys we're going for it and and I yeah. think you want a client who who's who's in it to win it, and uh, it's it's a very low asshole environment. I, I come from Twitter that way, and I think great agencies have swagger, and you just let them run with it, and you just be like, when they win, you tell them because it costs nothing. It costs nothing to say thank you. It costs nothing I, to I, say great I, job. I agree a thousand percent. So, what's the thing you th- you kind of suck at? I'm still learning about innovation and the commercial side of it. My boss has been a really good mentor on that, and so. You know, sometimes I go too far and he's like, hey, reel that in. You're losing people. How are you framing this? And he's teaching me how to do the commercials, how to do innovation. And that's a big part of it. I mean, comms is, you know, 20 percent of my time in my role. I wish it was 50, 60 percent of my time. But every weaknesses anyone has is just their strength overplayed. And so So even that sounded like a strength. I don't know. You no, no, it like sounded like a strength. No, you can look. You're just always working on stuff. It's just like you get... I mean, I, I can be around people who are just too much, and I can be too much, and I get too enthusiastic. I'm sometimes not good about empowering my team as much as I can. I mean, you know, I love when he talks like this, and then he tells us he's an introvert. <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> it outside, listen, yeah. advertising just gets me jazzed. Like, if, again, if you don't That's get excited about doing source. this, this is my energy source. It's literally doing this, and at the end of the day, I've made too many decisions, and then I'm just like, uh, like rock <laughs> myself to sleep. So the title of this uh podcast is called Screaming Creativity, and maybe I'll give a little uh, background on why we chose that that title, because uh, I believe when the best creative work is when the idea lands in culture, what's the story the press writes about, that what's the thing that people love, share, and spread, and, you know, I call these ideas that are sort of screaming out there in culture, I want them to be loud and have an impact in society, and Devika, you've been part of so many great things. What is the secret to creating ideas that really have that level of impact that the world can't ignore? I actually think sometimes we overcomplicate these kinds of things and we make it sound like it's really tough. It's actually deadly, sort of deathly simple, I'd say. And the shared ambition has to come from the top. So not shared ambition. I think when our CCOs, Rob, and you are sort of the, you know, the, I've always said the soul and the sort of, you know, beacon of creativity for WPP and even in, when we work together at McCann. But when it comes from the business side, and I, I always say I love what we do and I scream creativity. And I really believe... If I scream creativity, not because I'm trying to make a big point of it, because that's what we do. If you're talking about a snacking company, right, your CEO is obsessed about the quality of the snacks, what's going in, what's the ingredient story, are we doing right by our product? That's what I do every day, which is we're in the business of creativity, making ideas that solve problems for our clients. So I obsess about it. Because if we get that right, if we are the best at it across all the different sort of channels and, you know, you know, media touch points there are, then we're doing right by clients. Mm-hmm. If we do that, we make money. So well, it's actually that simple. So the money part is interesting because, you know, there's always the debate of like, oh, we want to do something wildly creative, but we got to have big business results. And like, I think in the past is like, you know, they, they were certainly looked at as separate things, right? And I don't think they have to be mutually exclusive anymore. Like, I think that's how uh, it leads. So like, what's your take on that? Like, is creativity a growth you know, uh, engine for you? You can look no farther than Oreo. I would tell you to go look at Oreo in 2010, 2011, before they did 100 Days. And that brand had ads with, like, Donald Trump, Venus Williams. I mean, it was a single, low single-digit growth brand. And the work they did in 100 Days and what they did in social and idea, and not just the tweet in the dark, but like really 100 Days set that up and the work Lisa did, put that brand on a totally different trajectory. For Oreo's 100th birthday... They, the team at 360i literally created, 
uh, with FCB a different social idea and a simple little visual. It was essentially a Facebook post every day, just an Oreo in a different way. Sometimes they'd have the Oreo look like a soccer ball yeah, for course. whatever. And it was I, just, I, I, yeah. you know, some of it was planned. Some of it was spontaneous today, land on moon, you know, Mars picture, you know, it was red. And the pressure was on to come up with one of those every single day. But it put Oreo in a different cultural zeitgeist and literally changed the directory. And all of a sudden you have a brand go from literally low single digit to a 20% growth wow. brand on a, uh, that was a billion dollar brand. And that continued the pace. And it's because of that, that you get opportunities like working with Pink. That is because of that, you get opportunities to go do things with Game of Thrones. And I, I think people don't realize that that work opens doors and creates different conversations. Yeah. Cadbury, totally changed. The work on generosity that yeah. Ogilvy has done around the world has put that thing on an entire, like an absolute rocket ship. Let's talk about some of the work that Ogilvy and Mandela's have done together. What I love about the work that we're doing on Cadbury is there is one consistent global platform of generosity, but the way we do it in India is relevant for what's happening in India. And that is a real, real powerful testament to how do you take global platforms, but how do you localize it, especially when it comes to things like chocolate that have, you know, and I grew up in India, by the way, so Cadbury is something I grew up with, and I want to tell you something. I can't tell you how happy it makes me because it had died in the middle. What do you mean it had died in the middle? It, like it just had lost its luster, the brand. Lost it. It, it just Got totally it. lost its luster. And now when I go back to India and when I see sort of Cadbury regain its stature, it's not a chocolate brand in India. It is an iconic brand of India. Hmm. If you ask an Indian about Cadbury, and I can speak to it, it's our brand. It's, we think it's an Indian brand, <laughs> right? That's how powerful it is. So Shah Rukh Khan... Explain, sorry, for the audience, yeah. explain Shah Rukh Khan. So yeah. for those of you um, who don't know Shah Rukh Khan, it did win a titanium last year in Cannes, and it's won everything. But it's a very simple idea. Uh, Shah Rukh Khan is uh, the Brad Pitt, like, Maybe Plus, bigger than Brad. John Halverson no, no, of he's, India, right? He's John the Halverson. Brad Pitt yeah. merged with Tom Brady, merged with Leonardo yeah. DiCaprio of India. Yeah. Like he, there's, there's he is everything. Nothing. He is yeah. the everything. Yeah. SRK is everything in India. Probably the biggest, um, you know, celebrity. So you have small business suffering. You have Shah Rukh Khan, and then you have Diwali, which is the biggest holiday. How do you get small business if the platform is generosity to not suffer? to get people to shop at them. And what Cadbury did, which was really interesting, is they used the platform of generosity. We used AI and data to take Shah Rukh Khan and actually become an ambassador. We talk about influencer marketing. That was like the case of influencer marketing like we've never seen. Using deep fake and AI, we got him to become the spokesperson for every small business, zip code to zip code. Working with Wavemaker, this is where media and creative comes really close together, we were able to geo-target that so that if you lived in a certain zip code in Mumbai, I would be able to see Shah Rukh Khan deliver an ad to me for a store that was in my neighborhood. Yeah, I mean, it was amazing, amazing unbelievable. Piece. You know, the interesting thing about that ad is you can look at that in isolation and be super proud, and I gleam with it. But what I love is that look at the three-year journey on exactly. this. Exactly. Three years ago, we do a TV ad, and we were out there talking to India about, we think there's a new vision for what creativity looks like. We think it's about moving away from TV to personalization. This is where the world's going. And no, no marketing unit, I work with 14 business units around the world, and no business unit embraced this harder than India. And they were a TV dominant market who had won amazing awards for their world-class storytelling. <laughs> And they just go, we buy in. That's why the idea is so important. Because sometimes when we talk about personalization, we talk about the tools that we have. It almost shows. It's like, I'm going to personalize, but I'm going to make it really boring because I'm going to get to yeah. Rob and I'm going to serve Rob an ad and it's going to be really hyper-personalized, but Rob's not going to care about it because it actually has no meaning, no creativity, no idea. And that was the brilliance. Uh, well, but this is the journey we went on together. So when I got to Mondelez in 2017, we launched Personalization Scale. Yeah. And it was our vision for personalization and we were out early on this, and it's because I believe mass marketing and FMCG is low single digit, dumb, gross, and my purpose on this planet is to kill it. I just hate it on yeah. so many fundamental levels. So what happened was, is being a media dork, I started out and been like, well, we're going to start with segmentation, and we're going to do all the segmentation, yeah. and we're going to put that in the brief. And so with Ogilvy, we rebuilt how we do personalization. We rebuilt the entire process, how we talk about it. We change from personalization scale to empathy at scale, explaining why we do it. And one of the things we did is we're going to get to a big idea first, 
And then we're going to think about the segments. And this is where I think people screw it up because they get very enamored with the technology. They get very enamored with their segments and all their knowledge of the consumer, the who, the hidden who, and all this other shit. And they don't get to the damn big idea. And the unlock for us is when we said, once we get to the idea, then how can we make it better by personalizing it? Exactly. When you put the other thing in there, you get fragmented ideas and you never break through. And once we fix that, it's been to the moon. Yeah. And all the work got stronger so, everywhere. So if there's a young person out there who doesn't know anything about our business and has not watched Bad Men or seen the things we're talking about, like – how do we convince them that this is a business for them? I mean, I think one of the things about uh, young people today is they don't want to do any one thing, right? They actually want to ha have their hands in multiple things. I have a kid uh, who's 24, and he's like, I don't want to live my life doing one thing. I want to do a lot. And that there's data that will prove it. So I always say to young people, one, this is the one industry where you can have a singular job, but you can do many things, which is super interesting. So if you're interested in pure... You know, if you're interested in art direction, design, data, technology, using AI, right? All the things that we talk about moving the world forward, you can do it here. Guess what else we can do? We can change policy. And these are the four Ps that I talk about. Talk about changing policy. First, talk about that. The first thing I want to talk about, in the Honduras, one out of four women under 18 gets pregnant. Non-consensual, consensual. If you had the morning after pill, you could go to jail for six years. Only country in Latin America. And actually, when you think about it in 2022, this was in 2022, you just go, wait, wait, what? So what we did is we just built a wooden platform off the jurisdiction of Honduras water body. Because you can just go off the, you know, to the international water line. We took a boat and took people there to go get the morning after pill. Created a ma sort of massive furor in that marketplace. And today it is now legal. So we changed policy using creativity. With Dove, the Crown Hair Act, black women face two and a half times more discrimination for in interviews if they have their natural hair. So we're working with Dove, and now in the US, there's the Crown Hair Act in multiple states right, where it's illegal to discriminate. So we can change policy. We're working with the ERA. We're the only country, the US is the only country in the world that does not give grant women constitutional equality. Mm -hmm. We're using creativity again to create cultural conversations and social movements. With the goal to change policy. With the goal to change policy. And I say it publicly to say, our commitment as Ogilvy is we will change five policies in the next five years. People so have talked about purpose-led marketing yeah. and maybe there's too much of it. I believe there's not enough of it. You know, I believe governments don't have the money or don't necessarily have the skills to really help people, which is why governments were set up in the first place, was to help people. We've lost that sort of thread. But brands, and, and yeah. obviously, you know, you've been a big part of it, uh, at Mandalas and, and many others have really stepped up and, and filled that void. So is that something you talk about within your walls of like, this is our responsibility? This is a, because I, I do think young people especially will cancel brands that aren't necessarily doing the right thing. They're fine with you making money, but you better be doing the right thing. You better be doing right by society, right by the environment, right in general. So is it something you guys talk about as a corporation, as a leadership group? Like, is it part of you know, your uh, approach? It's a core part of the business. I mean, I, I get it from the top. I think we made sustainability a pillar of our strategy for a reason because there's a deep commitment to that. Our early work in Cocoa Life just to create a program to ethically source cocoa and change the life of many of those farmers was ahead of its time, and we probably don't talk about that enough. And then I think each of the brands, you know, uh, my boss installed is like a really clear purpose. And they don't all have to be, you know, to save the ocean yeah. or things like yeah. that. But all Bonnie of them need to have a – a purpose and when we live that purpose to its potential and we really just it's not about what we say but what we do I think great things happen and that's that's what I think modern brand building looks like in all of it so let's talk about leadership because I think you both are both amazing leaders from what I know working with you and what I've seen uh, getting to know you and seeing what you've even just watching you on video I was like this guy's pretty damn good and you <laughs> came and spoke to WPP our, our leadership group and I literally went up to him, chase John down as he was leaving. I'm like, you have to be on my podcast. The success of the podcast is literally on you, John. So what do you think makes a great leader? I think for me, leadership comes from finding your authenticity. And I talk about this a lot with my team. I have a very diverse leadership team, and they all have very different styles. I think the common thread is, are you able to read a situation 
And do you have you built enough leadership styles that you have arrows in your quiver and you know when and how to deploy and flex that? So often I say, look, you have a forehand and a backhand. I like to lead through vision. It's my type of style. I like to talk about here's where we're going. There's this great waterfall. We should go out for that. And, and that is my natural style. I want to inspire people. I want to win through persuasion, not through coercion or you asymmetrical information or hierarchy or any of that crap. I, that's my natural style. I have a different style that's probably a little bit more democratic, which is on the off of it, like, hey, let's take a vote. I, I do something with my leadership team. I make a decision. If six or if six of them out of the eight disagree, I have no veto. So we do we do things probably once or twice a year that I don't want to do. I, I had a big epiphany in, in my leadership development when I was – I had a CEO hired a coach for me when I was – like probably you know like 26 same same with me yeah i hired a coach and just literally they showed me a visual and it was of a guy literally holding the bottle of jack daniels it was this rock star and they'd done surveys of my global team around the world on png and what they came back and said you're a rock star you show up you do a great presentation then you blow out of town and but i would go to one place after another and i thought that's what success was i would if there was a meeting in png i was going to be there cincinnati one day guangzhou the next singapore and i would i was like i won that meeting and i'd move on and I created a damn mess. And, and I remember her showing this to me and just me breaking down in total tears because mm-hmm. it's not who I wanted to be. Yeah. And the success and the ROI and the number were never going to make me happy. And I made a real pivot. I'm like, and she's just like, well, there's successful leaders who look like this. And I go, I don't want to be that human. And I made a real pivot to be like, I will not be that way. So when I go to markets, my rule is I won't go for less than three days. Like, because I'm not going to blow in, do dinner, and then leave. Like, I'm going to commit to really help the team. I'm going to do one-on-ones, like, skip levels down, and it creates, you know, scare because people are like, why is John calling this junior person? But those are things I'm committed to as a leader, and that's how I show up and I think is super important. Devika, uh, quickly talk about your, your take on leadership. I always think about that I don't operate from a place of power, which is getting people to um, – sort of adhere to my power, but I always think about my job as um, unlocking their potential. And I take that very seriously to say, if I can't get, I really believe 99% of people have incredible potential. And I think it is the job of leaders to unlock it. And when we can do that, the company does better. In doing that, you actually build trust. And in doing that, it takes a lot of work because I have to get to know each person. And I really try to invest a lot of time in getting to know people, their unique strengths, their individuality. What is their situation at home? Because we keep saying, bring your authentic self to work. If I'm going to tell people to bring their authentic self, I need to understand what's happening in their lives. Two is, I always say, I have to do, not say. right? Because I can tell them, nobody follows PowerPoint slides, people follow actions. So one of the commitments I always make, we, I talk about creativity, and I said, you know, I sit there and I scream creativity. Nobody's going to listen if I don't get my hands dirty. Yeah. So I make a commitment, even on creativity, to say I'll be assistant account executive for three ideas every year. And I follow through with that. Leaders today need to act, not say. And the third thing is trust. Mm. The minute, the most important thing is building trust with your team. And if you are seen as a leader today violating that trust, when somebody puts that trust in you, and you violate that trust. I think, yeah. like, I think that's Agreed. done. What's something uh, people don't know about you, John? Well, I, I think the thing is, every year I try and learn something different. That journey has taken me to take 30 classes at Institute of Culinary Education in New York. I'm ballroom dancing, boxer. I'm currently learning golf. I was an Iron Man. But I try and learn one new thing every year, and it just takes me on amazing. And I just, the entire goal is just to be more interesting at a cocktail party. Wait, just, I have to go after this? Yeah. <laughs> if we were at a restaurant the other night, and John, he got his coat check, and he had a ticket, and out come three random golf clubs. <laughs> and we're like, what the hell is this? Middle and of a uh, rainstorm. Middle of a clear. rainstorm. So uh, explain your. I just like, I like having a good joke, and I love a good laugh. And one of the things I do, just for a gag, is anytime I go out to a nice restaurant, I will literally check some obscure items. So I've checked stuffed animals, three random golf clubs, uh, floaties, uh, you name it. Yeah, <laughs> literally a stuffed hippopotamus. Game on. I'm going to beat you with one thing. You go. What's a I only creative have, side hustle of, of uh I have Devica. one skill, and I'm really good at. Yep. I can pee standing up. 
We gotta go to commercial now. Uh, <laughs> did you just say I can pee standing up? I did, I but there, look, there's a story. It's Thank you to here. Spotify for this. I'm gonna change subject. Is there a story? There is, is a very is important. An, is there a real story? There is a really important story okay. actually. Go. I grew up in India. I have two older brothers. Patriarchal society. So the boys get everything. The boys could ride bikes. I couldn't because if I fell down and got stitches, then nobody's gonna marry me. So I wanted to be a boy. So I was like, I got it. So when I was six years old one day, I went running out to my family, and I was like, I did it, I did it, I did it. And they're like, what'd you do? I said, I can pee standing up. Because I thought that's all I needed to do. So the story is actually very powerful. Is it? It is, is it? powerful. I, mean, I, think it's, I think it's powerful, but I'm still struggling <laughs> with the visual. Oh, you don't have to imagine. <laughs> I didn't ask I, you to imagine. I can't it. stop myself. <laughs> all, it is what it is. Thank you. But I, I get your point. It is a powerful Insight and and sort it's a cultural insight. So uh, I made Rob Riley speechless. Yeah, you have no idea. I think might yeah. made the whole room speechless. <laughs> if we pan around to the rest of the room, they're all uh, it, no. It's actually an, an interesting, and that's the whole point of this podcast: <laughs> is you say whatever the hell you want. Why should we stay in the business? You know, like why have you chosen to stay not only at Mondelez but in the business of of advertising and creativity? I, it's the people. I think this industry attracts the most amazing weirdos. And I don't think that you can go to any industry in the world and find as interesting as people as you can find inside the halls of advertising and marketing. And I feel so blessed by the gifts I've been given by this industry to meet all the exciting people and just the great mentors and people and just people who just push. And it's just like, and I know that if I left this industry and I was the manager of a Dairy Queen tomorrow, I'd still be friends with all of them. And I think that's so cool. I mean, I have to agree uh, 100%. Um, there isn't another industry with more interesting people. You know, since he's already talked about that, I want to add to it. But I it's also the power of what we can do. I in a commoditized world where everybody's got sort of the same issues, the ability to come into work every day and imagine a new reality for a chocolate, imagine a new reality for people who can get a morning after pill, imagine a new reality for a soap that can become a cultural icon. Imagine a new reality for an icon like IBM that can become the most modern tech company. I and this it. industry has such incredible human energy because of the potential of what it can do that I find that it's like, you know, it's literally like a charging button for me. It's like it's, you plug it in and you go, zoom. Like I, like, I like it. We're ending on bazoom. <laughs> well, I just want to say thank you to, to both of you, uh, you know, for doing this and being part of the, the pilot episode. And, and thank you to Emily and the team at Spotify and the, the, the crew here from Hogarth and our, our, our post-production team at BCW. You know, it takes a lot of people to put this together and Jonathan and Alex on, on, on my team. So we're going to hopefully edit this thing together. Uh, maybe thank we'll keep you, it standing, standing up uh, peeing in. Well, you better keep that in. Yeah. No. Well, listen, <laughs> I got people screaming from the off. Yeah, off. Keep, it uh, keep it in. They all want it in. Okay, the vote is the, how many people want to keep this? Oh, look at this. There you look go. This. this is strong. <laughs> this is strong. Don't invite Devika to your wedding if that's the case. So uh, thanks again, everybody. Thank you, Rob. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. Screaming Creativity is produced by WPP and Hogarth, edited by Rob C. Ward at BCW, and supported by our partners at Spotify.